Let me first say to this audience here that this presentation is being taped by the Texas Criminal Defense Lawyers Association. Uh, they're going to make a little video for the members of TCDLA um, on this topic. So while I'm talking live to members of the Harris County Public Defender's Office, I'm also talking to a broader audience uh, statewide of defense attorneys. So if some of the things I say seem to be not directed exactly at everyone in this room, that's why. Um, again, my name is Ted Wood. My job with the Harris County Public Defender's Office is to be a legislative liaison between our office and the, take, uh, the state legislature. And so I spend a lot of time um, looking at bills that are filed, offering testimony on ones that we support, offering testimony on ones that we don't support. And we've had some luck in getting some, some good things passed and actually in getting some things stopped that were detrimental to us. So that's, that's my job. And besides drafting language that might become law and testifying on bills and that sort of thing, it's part of my job to try and come back and tell you what has happened in the legislature and so that we can go forward and, and use some of that. And that's my purpose today. I have a handout that I've given to everyone. And the reason I didn't do a PowerPoint is that this is quite intensive and in looking at the language of the statute and at a particular motion. And so I want you to have that. Everyone in this room has it. And those of you who are watching this video, you should have an accompanying 14 or 15 page handout that you're not going to get anything out of this presentation without the handout. So please have that uh, at the ready so we can look at it. What I'm going to talk about today are two bills that cover the same territory. One is Senate Bill 1913. The other is House Bill 351. These were both passed in the 85th legislative session, which occurred in uh, the spring of 2017. And the law went into effect on September 1st, 2017. Well, today is December 11th, 2018. So we're 15 months past this. And um, we really haven't taken advantage of the law that has been passed. So that's why I want to get the word out to the Public Defender's Office here in Harris County. That's why we want to get the word out statewide to what happened. First of all, Senate Bill 1913 uh, was sponsored by Senator Judith Zaffarini of Laredo. House Bill 351 was uh, authored by Representative Terry Canales of the Valley. And both bills started in different places. House Bill 351 was a very short bill. Senate Bill 1913 was a very long bill. And during the legislative process, Senate Bill 1913 became a little bit shorter. House Bill 351 became a little bit longer. And they ended up in the same place. But what they ended up doing was putting into effect a policy that the Texas Judicial Council wanted to see happen. And for those of you that are not familiar with the Texas Judicial Council, it's the policy-making arm of the state judicial branch. And it's made up of about 20 individuals. A lot of them are judges. And the lead member is Chief Justice Nathan Hecht of the Texas Supreme Court. And he has been extremely supportive of efforts to try and keep people from being put into jail or serving time simply because they can't pay their fines or their court costs. And uh, he's the lead member of the Judicial Council. And so this was an initiative that the Judicial Council supported, and it took the shape of these two bills. So now I want to get to the specifics of the bills. And what I mentioned on the very first page is that we could talk about a lot of different aspects of Senate Bill 1913. And I'll just refer to both bills as Senate Bill 1913 because they are essentially the same. But they put into place a provision in the Code of Criminal Procedure, which I have highlighted there on the first, place, uh, first page. It's Article 42.15 and specifically subsection A1 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. So if you'll turn with me to the second page, I have set out subsection A1, and I know this seems uh, dry, but what I want to do is just read through this statute 
word for word, and it takes the upper half of this second page. I've tried to highlight what I think are the key parts. So let's read this. It says, notwithstanding any other provision of this article, during or immediately after imposing a sentence in a case in which a defendant entered a plea in open court as provided by Article 27.13, 27.14a, or 27.16a, a court shall inquire whether the defendant has sufficient resources or income to immediately pay all or part of the fine and costs. Let's just stop there, okay? Let's look at these key things. During or immediately after imposing a sentence. That means when the person pleads guilty or when the person has been found guilty after the sentencing phase, right then, at that point, there is supposed to be a determination made by the judge as to whether this person can afford to pay the fine that's been assessed and whether the person can afford to pay the court costs that are assessed. And in a lot of cases, you're not going to even have a fine assessed. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. But you will always, in any conviction, and even in situations where there's an order of deferred adjudication, you will always have court costs assessed because it's automatic. The statutes say that upon conviction, this court cost here shall be assessed. This one over here shall be assessed. Typically, in a felony case, that's going to add up to $450, $500. In a misdemeanor case, a lot of times it's more in the $250, $300 range. But those court costs are going to be assessed. Now, notwithstanding the fact that they've been assessed, what this statute says is right then, a court shall inquire. So this is not something that you need to beg and plead for the court to do. They're supposed to do this on their own. That doesn't mean it's happening. My understanding on talking to, to you is that this never happens in Harris County. And I don't think this happens in most places in the state of Texas. I'm not saying it doesn't happen in, in some places. But for whatever reason, judges uh, either are not aware of this or they're, they're not following it. And so what I'm suggesting to all of us is that we need to prompt the judges. We need to let the judges know that this is their duty to make this finding. So let's go on. They need to, they need to inquire whether the defendant has sufficient resources or income to immediately pay all or part of the fines and costs. In other words, can you pay it today? Immediately means today. Not a month from now, not six months from now. Today, can they pay it today? All right, so that's the first thing that they need to determine. Let's go on with the statute. If the court determines that the defendant does not have sufficient resources or income to immediately pay all or part of the fine and cost, the court shall determine whether the fine and cost should be, and then there are four choices. Okay, number one, required to be paid at some later date. So it is okay for the judge to find, look, you can't pay it today, but based on your circumstances, I think you can pay a monthly amount and pay this off over a year or what have you. That's, that's acceptable. That's an acceptable finding. Another one, discharged, this is number two, discharged by performing community service. Okay? And that's something that we're going to look for a lot of times. In lieu of having that person on the hook for the fine and the court costs, um, they can be ordered to perform community service. The third one is the judge has the option to waive in full or in part the assessed fine and the court costs. And finally, the fourth one is some combination of those first three options. <coughs> so this is new, a new thing for judges. They're not used to it. And in Harris County, at least, we have a great opportunity because we have a lot of new judges that are going to take the bench in three weeks. We still have some judges from before um, and in other parts of the state. Certainly there are going to be some new judges, but you're going to be working with a lot of existing judges. And so to some extent, this is going to be teaching old judges some new things.
But to a large extent, and especially in Harris County, we have a great opportunity to right from the very beginning let these new judges know that this is a responsibility that they have to uh, make this inquiry. And to the extent that they doubt what you're saying, or they, they, they just can't quite believe it, we have some bench cards that have been put together by the Texas Office of Court Administration. And this is an entity that uh, I used to work for in Austin before I came here to work for the Harris County Public Defender's Office. And their job, in part, <coughs> excuse me, is to educate judges on certain things, all right? And so they have a bench card. There's actually two bench cards. The first one, and it will take uh, two pages here, if you look on the third, this should be the third page of your handout, it's uh, called Bench Card for Judicial Processes Relating to the Collection of Fines and Costs. And then under that it says, district and county court version applies to jailable offenses. So whether you are in the felony trial division here at the Harris County Public Defender's Office or whether you're in misdemeanor mental health, this is the bench card that is going to be applicable to your cases. And I want you to look right about halfway down on this first sheet. It says new requirement for assessing ability to pay during or immediately after sentencing. It cites Article 42.15, and the very first sentence is exactly what I've been saying here. We want to get this across to the judges. At the sentencing of a defendant who enters a plea in open court, and this could be a plea of, of uh, guilty, a plea of no contest, a plea of guilty, or a plea of not guilty, I'm sorry. At the sentencing, when imposing a fine and cost, the judge is required to inquire whether the defendant has sufficient resources or income to immediately pay all or part of the fine and costs. And then it lists the different options that the judge has. Okay? So if they're not going to take your word for it, uh, okay, pull this out from the Office of Court Administration. I've given you the website address where you can get it or you can just copy this off and let them know that the, the Office of Court Administration has put this out there so that judges are aware that this is what happens. Following this, this will be on the uh, fourth and fifth pages in, there's a separate bench card for justice and municipal courts. And I'm aware that those of you here in the Harris County Public Defender's Office are not working in the justice and municipal courts, but a lot of you who are maybe watching this video do practice in those courts. That's where the, the, the punishment is only a fine, and there are court costs assessed there, just like there are in the other trial courts. Things are slightly different here. I won't go into the details, but here's the bench card, and uh, it's especially tailored to the justice and municipal courts. If you get past uh, these bench cards on the handout, I've got a paragraph here on what's denominated as page 7. And I go through what I've already told you, that judges should make this evaluation without being prompted. Um, our judges this week, our new judges are at New Judges School in Austin. I have no idea if this is on the agenda, if this is something that they learn about or not. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. I hope it is. But um, I have a feeling that maybe it's not. And so um, while, while we should be able to have the judges sua sponte, on their own, do things that they're required to do under the law, uh, we need to nudge them along a little bit and make sure they're doing it. Now, you should be able to do this orally, frankly, but um, I'm not sure that that's going to work right away. I think over time that judges are just going to automatically do this and make the evaluation. They'll get used to it. But what I've put together here for you are a couple of motions. The first one is designed to be used in district court in felony cases. And it's a motion for the court to make an ability to pay inquiry. And in the first paragraph of this motion, I talk about Article 42.15, subsection A1, and specifically quote the language that the judge shall um, inquire whether the defendant has sufficient resources to immediately pay. The second paragraph reminds the judge that at the outset of this case, you found my client to be indigent, and counsel was appointed to represent the client. 
Now again, that makes sense for all of us here in the Public Defender's Office, where the only clients we represent are indigent clients, every last one of them. But this applies not only to public defenders, but also to attorneys in private practice who have been appointed on cases. They would not have been appointed if the person was not found indigent. Where this probably doesn't apply, or at least doesn't apply so much, is if you're an attorney and you're being paid by the defendant uh, to represent him or her. Then, most likely, the judge is going to find that this person does have the ability to immediately pay. Maybe not always, but most of the time. However, for those of us in the public defender's office, those of us who are representing indigent clients uh, in private practice, this should be almost a no-brainer for the judge because just a few days ago or a few weeks ago, this defendant was found to be indigent. And now, as we say in this paragraph, nothing much has changed. There could be the rare situation where something has changed, but typically not. And so we are the last line accordingly. The defendant requests that this court, in this case, waive the assessed fine and cost. That's one of the options. But this is something that I talked about with our, uh, with our director here, the public defender, Alex Bunnan, here in Harris County. And what, what he and I talked about was, look, if you have a person who's been convicted of a felony, a lot of times, chances are, they're going to prison. And they're not going to be able to perform community service in prison. And they're not going to be able to pay this out over time. And uh, so it only makes sense that we should ask that the fines and the fees be waived. On the next page, we have an order, a proposed order that the judge can sign. And we really only put two boxes there. One is that the fine and costs assessed against the defendant be waived. And the other one is if the judge finds otherwise, he or she can check the box that says, well, I find the defendant has sufficient resources to pay. But again, most of the time, um, the facts are going to be such that this person can't pay. Okay, if you turn the page to the next motion, this is designed for county courts at law or in other parts of the state where the constitutional county courts are hearing these cases. This is designed for misdemeanor cases. And we go through the first paragraph again, talking about kind of the basis for the law. And then we give some options for the judge here. One of them is to order the defendant to perform community service in lieu of making these payments. The other one is just to outright waive it. And there is a statute that talks about how judges should assess community service before they outright waive the costs. So that may happen to your clients, especially your misdemeanor clients. But I want to have you think about something here, those of you that represent uh, clients here on misdemeanor cases. Um, a lot of them may have a physical reason why they cannot perform community service, or maybe it's an emotional or mental reason that they cannot perform community service. So this would be a good time to explain to the judge that not only can my client not afford to pay this, but my client is in no shape for whatever reason to perform community service, and we ask that you just outright waive the fine and the cost. This is... Um, this is almost a bird's nest on the ground. I, I don't know how else to say it. It's, it's a very favorable law that has been put in place by our legislature. And really all we need to do is make the judges aware of it and pursue it. Um, there's an order that goes along with this. And it's kind of what I talked about. There's a couple more options on there simply because the people aren't going to prison. And then the final two pages, I won't get into this, but this is an explanation of the motion to the court to make the ability to pay inquiry. So you can read that at your leisure. It's uh, two pages of a little more detail. Um, that's all I have. I'm glad to answer any questions that you might have. I have a question. Yes. Um, the determination of a person's ability to pay, is there any guidelines on that, or is that completely subjective? Well, that is subjective. Um, and it is possible. It is possible that a person could have been appointed, a court-appointed attorney, because they could not afford to pay whatever that lump sum was to get this going, and still have a job, and still have the ability to perhaps uh, pay, especially over time. 
even if they can't come up with the, let's say, $500 fine and another $500 in, in uh, court costs. That's possible. And so some judges will take the position that, all right, you can't pay it all today. We're going to uh, put you on a payment plan. Can you afford to do this? I expect that some judges may want to do that. I still think that we ought to try and argue that these court costs be outright waived or short of that, that at least the person be allowed to perform community service. But to answer your question, there is no statutory, um, there is no statute out there that addresses this particular amount of money uh, is, is not enough uh, to pay. It, it's going to be on the, on the basis of what the judges think, and a lot of what the judges think are going to be on how we approach it and, and argue our client's particular circumstance. Uh, Natalie. judges don't violate based on cost, but eventually we whittle away if there are other reasons for violating their deferred, and we get down the costs, and they, well, they haven't paid their costs, you know, the state always says, but this was supposed to have been happening from September of last year, so is there a way for us to, like, retroactively use it in MAJ hearings? Okay. Um, I think that's a good argument to say, judge, although we didn't um, have you waived these costs up front back six months ago? The law was in place then, and we really should have done it. Um, but my client could not afford to pay this, and this, this was why he or she did not make the payments, not because they uh, disrespected the court, not because they didn't want to. They wanted to, but they couldn't do it. And so we ask that you don't um, adjudicate them for this reason. My experience has been that while there are a lot of cases where one of the reasons uh, for adjudicating a person who'd been placed on deferred adjudication is that they didn't pay their court costs, that when all the other reasons shake out, courts, even before this, were reluctant to adjudicate somebody or to revoke somebody's uh, probation solely on the basis of cost. So I would, again, I would make the argument. And, Right, and that's listed right at the top of, of, your, of your bench card. The U.S. Supreme Court has held that courts may not incarcerate a person for non-payment of fines and costs. There it is. So it's, most, most judges know that. Most judges won't violate based on that. I feel, yeah. and I, I, I ran into that in our court. It was the other day, but it was always used as a And I guess my other question is, is so I think you said this, but the, it is the judge's duty to do this, even if we don't file a motion or whatever. The judge needs to be doing it. Yes, that's that's what's supposed to happen, okay. Eric. So what if we request it and the judge agrees? Well, I think that would certainly be a great point for appeal, uh, or or a motion for new trial, maybe. I. I there would be ways to try and attack that, but yes. So if we did it and we filed a notice of appeal and the judge says, okay, I'm going to give your client an appeal bond, you know, you file them, you know the routine, right? And the client's like, I don't want to do an appeal bond, I don't want to do an appeal. So we're kind of in a, in a, a catch-22. Mm -hmm. um, is there any other way to enforce it other than, like, filing a, a notice of appeal? I mean, maybe a motion for the trial might be a better route. Well, those are the two routes that come to mind. And let me give that some thought, Eric. I, Okay, yeah, there is a statute in the Code of Criminal Procedure. It's 103.008, I, th I think. Um, and it talks about within a year after the judgment making a motion to correct costs. And that may be a way. You make it in the trial court. So that may be a way to do it, too. Um, I am hopeful, though, that we won't meet resistance on this, um, that this is spelled out clearly by the legislature, uh, spelled out by the Office of Court Administration. Let me say one more thing about, about Chief Justice Nathan Hecht. As the Chief Justice of the, of the Supreme Court of Texas, he goes to a lot of conferences around the country that it's a meeting of the Chief Justices of the, of the various Supreme Courts in, in the country. And what happened in Ferguson, Missouri has been a huge topic of discussion. And 
some, somewhat underlying the problems there are that people were being jailed in Ferguson for non-payment of fines. And this is, uh, again, contrary to US Supreme Court law, and it's been a huge topic of discussion um, among the Chief Justices. And so Chief Justice Hecht has, uh, um, to the extent he didn't already think about this stuff, he thinks about it a lot now, and he's the lead person on the Judicial Council. And when the Judicial Council gets behind a legislative proposal, they usually pass. And they're usually carried by an influential senator. Uh, in fact, we have a couple senators and a couple representatives who are on the Judicial Council. Senator Zaffarini is one of those. So she listened to this. She considered it. She was eager to file Senate Bill 1913 and get it passed. In fact, there were a lot of parts of that that, that didn't make it all the way through the legislative process. It was more ambitious than it even ended up being. But there is a, and leading judges in this state to see that this happens. It's unfortunate that there's sometimes a little lag time between the law actually becoming effective and, and me doing my job and getting the, the word out to you that, hey, this law is passed. In fact, that's why I put it as a news flash. That's kind of being a little funny because it, it's not like this happened this morning. This happened 15 months ago, but hey, I think maybe some of you are hearing about it for the first time. Jane. From a practical perspective about making the judges aware of the process, yes. and I'm not trying to be funny, but can't the Office of Court Administration 1 just like mail these to the judges or somehow disseminate it directly to the judges from that office? And then locally, um, I don't know if we're planning a meeting with the new judges, but maybe even their attorney, like you meet with their attorney or whoever, and say we have this process, and so we can kind of make them aware of it, you know, from the start, instead of just doing it at a sentencing or when there are a plea and there are 50 people in line to take a plea, so we can be, you know, affirmatively move forward, be proactive about it instead of waiting until like a case comes. Well, that, that is a great point. I will tell you that the Office of Court Administration is not a judicial training entity. It's not the Texas Center for the Judiciary. It's not uh, the Texas Municipal Courts Education Center. Those training entities are especially charged with training their judges. And I can guarantee you that at the lower court levels, at the justice court level and the municipal court level, they are being taught this. Uh, because I know the individuals who run those training programs and that this is the kind of thing they train their judges on to know. Now, the Texas Center for the Judiciary, I'm I, a little less familiar with. There's a lot of material for them to cover. This may not be on their um, radar as the most important thing, but to the extent that it's not, we need to try and educate them. I can also tell you that when I worked for the Office of Court Administration, one of my main jobs was being an interface with the district clerks and the county clerks. And so I spoke at their conferences all the time, and people from OCA continue to do that. And sometimes if you can educate the clerks that this is necessary, you have, in effect, educated the judges and gone a long way toward doing that. Roger, yes. So I'm in, I think I'm the only one who goes to misdemeanor court in this room, but when I've been going to um, county court at laws, they've been not doing exactly what this says, but almost always, because of my clients are indigent, they will say, well, I'm ruling the court costs, making them run concurrent with this sentence. So they give them enough credit that they have zeroed out the court costs. From this, I think- Without serving more time. Without serving more time. They don't have time on, especially if it's time serving on bond. But reading this, it sounds like that may not have been proper to begin with, but it still ends up with the result of them. Well, it still ends up with the result of them owing nothing, and that's a good thing. And I, there's something I forgot to, to say here, is that part of this bill, Senate Bill 1913, expanded what counts as community service. So now working to get your GED, taking certain kinds of classes. This is on the bench card. You can read it. Um, taking certain kind of classes, even... even uh, That's to satisfy the cost. If the judge says, yep, um, sir, ma'am, you cannot, I find that you cannot afford to pay this immediately, but um, I order you, in lieu of doing that, to perform community service. The bill also said that now you get credit of at least, at least $100 for every hour of community service that you perform. 
I'm sorry, $100 for every eight hours of community service that you perform. Okay? I think that's what it, yeah. let me, yeah. Yeah, each day served, right. Yes. So on a deferred adjudication, the sentence is not being imposed, right? Technically, that's correct, and technically, there's no conviction. But if you look at the court cost statutes, almost all of them, when they say, upon conviction, thou shalt pay X amount of dollars, there's another statute that says, for purposes of paying court costs, conviction means, and one of the things is deferred adjudication. So for all practical purposes, even though technically it's not a conviction, uh, that's when these are being assessed, and it, that's the time to bring it up, right, right then. Right. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Sure.